This study of the chapter of Romans 8 is a fantastic study, but it's especially astounding if you happen to fall in the category of accused personalities versus deceived personalities. Who, who here would consider themselves an accused personality? What's that? That means that you're kind of listening to that tape that you're not good enough, you've messed up. You're... Wow. All right. So, you know, my wife and I are not necessarily two peas in a pod because we're opposites in a lot of ways. She is, I think, a prototypical accused personality, and I am an absolutely deceived personality. It doesn't matter what's going on. There are the bluebirds of happiness are singing around my head, and everything's going to be all right, and I'm all right too. You know, it's a beautiful thing. And, and so we'll go back and forth about, you know, having an accused nature versus having a deceived nature. And then the other day I said to her, I was like, you know, honey, I know that you're kind of, you know, unfortunately vulnerable to a lot of Satan's lies and what he wants to kind of detract as he accuses the saints. Um, and, and, and I get that, and I'm sorry for that. But why does there only have to be two options, like accused and deceived? Couldn't there be like a third option, like accurate? <laughs> and she just looked at me and her head fell and just said, you've reached a new level of self-deceit. <laughs> so anyway, the other morning, I'm having breakfast with Steve Kennard. You know, I bought him breakfast, too. And he was... <laughs> All right, let's turn over to Romans chapter 8. Anyway, I was, I was telling him at breakfast how a few years back I was, I was having, uh, I was actually having drinks with Bruce Springsteen and I was telling him all about that event. <laughs> Seemed like he had a story that he was saving up for me, but he held back. All right, long chapter. What we're going to do though is, uh, because we don't have time to read through the whole chapter, then go back and then read section by section, as much as I don't necessarily prefer doing it this way, I am going to read a section, we'll stop, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of the real just gems that we've got here that help us not only understanding the Holy Spirit, but understanding ourselves and understanding what the Holy Spirit does to our relationship with God and even God's greater and bigger plan of ultimate glorification and redemption of all of creation itself. Okay, here we go. Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the accused personality types all say, mm, mm, maybe, yeah, I, I don't know. You're going to have to give me more than that. And, and by the way, as one who is like ultimately deceived, I mean, edge of the bell curve deceived, this passage and all of these passages here, I kind of view as like, mm, nice, nice, not thrilling, but nice. Something that maybe grandma might cross-stitch onto a pillow somewhere, but you know, not kind of the stuff that really I need. Just give me a command, give me a charge to, to kind of run after something uh, versus kind of all of these nice affirmations that you're good enough and you're smart enough and doggone it, people like you. <laughs> because through Christ Jesus, the law of... That's a Saturday Night Live reference. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh 
to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The, the first section here I want to just kind of talk about as distinction. And the distinction begins to be laid out rather profoundly in these first eight verses of the distinction between living by the flesh and living by the Spirit. And in living by the Spirit, some of the things that really begin to, to, to be recognized here is that in, in the Spirit, all that was the will of God, all that was the value and compass setting of God that was shown to us in the Torah, in the law, wasn't able to be achieved on fleshly effort and clarity of the written word, but now is finally achieved, finally realized for God and his people through the Holy Spirit, and only through the Holy Spirit. And any attempts at trying to not do this by the Holy Spirit or rely on the Holy Spirit is going to result in frustration, uh, as has always been the case for, for all of God's people prior to the, the covenant unveiling the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and while we, we, we say here that Paul doesn't say we fulfill the law's righteous requirement, as though you are now kind of just hitting it on all cylinders, and now you are flawless with regard to your adherence to the law. He doesn't say we fulfill the law's requirement, but rather that the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. Why? Because the ultimate aim of the law was God's precious people in perfect communion and harmony with him. All of that comes about, not because of your track record, all of that comes about because of now who you are. You are not who you were. You are now a new creation, and a new creation that is defined not by your earthly DNA, but now by your spiritual DNA. The fact that the Spirit has now come to not just abide in you, but to recreate you into who you were always meant to be in alignment with God. And it points to not your work, but the work of the Holy Spirit. But it does say that the, in order that the righteousness or the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. There are three different ways that people speak of righteousness. And righteousness, by the way, is probably kind of nicely understood as a track record of performance that establishes honor, dignity, value, and ultimately through that relationship. But how is it that you have this righteousness? Is it an imparted, an imputed, or an imparted righteousness? Now, what, what do you mean imputed versus imparted? Imputed is what is spoken of earlier in Romans when it talks of God imputed or credited righteousness to Abraham. Why? Because he had faith in Genesis 22. And thus God imputed or credited. So the word imputed just means credited, but it appears in some of our Bibles, so it's maybe you know, worthwhile to even recognize the word there. And what that means is, is that you sit here with a track record of righteousness that has been credited to you. And in the heavenly realms, where everything matters, that is how you are regarded. The, if, if honor, in an honor and shame society such as we have here, is the ultimate valuation, the currency that establishes that, that evaluation of honor is righteousness. The more righteous, the greater honor, the greater status, the greater relationship, the greater dignity that you have. What, one of the, the reasons that we have trouble with righteousness and understanding it is that the word, the, the, the word righteousness and the word justification 
actually, in the original language, are, are pretty much the same idea. Both of them are basically the word dekayasune. And in the original language, it, instead of kind of translating it justification, if we had translated it like righteousness defies you, if that is a thing you could even say without stumbling, then I think it would become more clear. Because I'm, I've always kind of thought of having been justified by grace as a subtraction operation, not an addition operation. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, well, oftentimes we use a mnemonic to remember what justified means. Justified means just as if I'd... Anybody ever... Just as if I'd never sinned. That's a subtraction operation. But righteousness and just, justification is basically made righteous. That's an addition operation. You're being given the righteousness of Christ. Why did Jesus come as a baby rather than just come as a 30-year-old, hop on the scene, Lamb of God, here I am, substitute atonement, bring it on, Pour it on me, all your mess, all your sin. I'll tell you, why? Because he also needed to establish all those years a record of righteousness. An amazing record of righteousness. And all that he did, and, and when he even begins his ministry, and he gets baptized, and they're like, oh, what are you doing that for? What does he say is the reason for him getting baptized? Exactly. Because i got to keep adding to the righteousness record that I'm going to give to Mark Bershon. I'm, I'm going to give him the most amazing righteousness. But, but I think too often, we just view the moment of our baptism as just a moment where now we've been erased. We've had a subtraction operation of our sins. And then, of course, what happens, you know, a few moments after baptism, pride, sin, lust, deceit, selfishness, all, all of that, and we're like, ah! Oh! Wait a minute, what happened? What happened to that gift that I just got? Look what I've just done. And if all we do is just focus on the negation, focus on the subtraction, then we, 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 it's easy to have an accused personality. But, and again, this passage is a great antidote for that. But you have fulfilled the righteousness of the law because you have also been given all the righteousness of Christ. So it's not just as if I'd never sinned. It's just as if I'd touch the leper, just as if I'd raised the widow named son, just as if I'd stood the ground of God's honor in the face of hypocrisy, just as if I'd worked tirelessly into the night to heal, woke up early to have an even better quiet time so that I'm ready to go another day to preach the gospel to other towns and villages. Just as if I'd fed the 5,000. Just as if I'd calmed the storm. Just as if I'd been given that righteousness. It's not just a subtraction operation. And where, where I live is, um, is the world's largest Navy base. Uh, I, I live in Virginia Beach, Virginia. But that's not where I grew up. I grew up in some place even more astounding. And that place is... The Garden State of New Jersey. Shangri-La. I think the reason that I have a, a deceived personality rather than accused personality is, is really because I grew up in such an Edenic state. And, and, and I know that the age to come when all things are made new, that I've had a, a kind of a peering into that through the beauty of really dwelling all those formative years in the garden state. But I digress, so back we go. In, in Virginia, where there's a Navy, you can be thrown into, into military prison, into the brig, and, and it's, it's one thing to, in a sense, be pardoned and to come out of that experience. If we're using the, kind of the analogy of baptism, let's say. That, that in, in baptism, you can have your record expunged. The reason that you're about to be dishonorably, uh, dishonorably discharged, taken away, and you can keep your status as one who is a, a soldier in good standing. And yeah, that's not so amazing about grace, though. If all you are is a subtraction operation, 
then you're not going to be able to come out of that ready to run against a troop, run through a wall for the, for the cause of Jesus Christ. But imagine, though, your, your record is hardened, you're being processed out of the military prison, and now as you're being processed out, uh, they've got your, your uniform there waiting for you. And, and there's your uniform, and you're like, oh my goodness, I still get to serve in the, in the Navy, this is amazing. But as they give you your uniform, and they've got, you know, canards stitched right on there, uh, as you're about to go back into service, and you think, wow, this is so amazing. But then you look at the uniform, and instead of being just, you know, the grunt uniform of, uh, of an enlisted folk, it instead, it is now adorned with the stars of an admiral, right? And, and, and now you're like, whoa, 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 if I put that on, they're going to throw me back in here for impersonating an officer. And they're like, no, 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 I, I, you need to check. And they go to the base commander and, they figure, and, and everybody sends word back, yes, this is right. And, and in fact, yes, not only has what happened to you pardoned you so that you can serve again, but you are now with the street cred righteousness of an admiral. And you have honor and you walk this life with dignity as perceived by all in the heavenly realms with your standing as it really is. You walk out of the brig and, you know, a little, not a, a big black car with two little American flags flying on the front comes up. You've got a personal driver. Uh, you're like, hey, I've, I've been in jail for the last few days. You know, I need to go and, 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 you know, buy some stuff. And you go to the Navy Exchange and they've got personal shoppers for you. People are falling all over themselves, saluting and genuflecting as you go by. I mean, this, this is the addition operation that justification brings your way. And when the Holy Spirit recreates, when you're born of water and spirit, the Spirit imputes to you this righteousness. You are not just the product of subtraction. You are the product of both subtraction and the most glorious addition you could ever begin to imagine. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't just impute righteousness, but I believe the Holy Spirit also imparts righteousness. That is that the Holy Spirit now in you empowers you. This imparting is that you have been empowered for righteousness. So not only do you walk around with a performance record that astounds all, but now with that performance record, you also now have a bent for proclivity and an empowerment that allows you to now do righteous things. Whereas before, you kind of walk into a campus and maybe just kind of check out who's good looking and think about, well, maybe I can kind of, you know, kind of pull up on that, see if I got an opening line, see how that goes, right? But, uh, that's, before the, that's before recreation. And now you walk into all those same social situations, whereas before you thought, hey, is there any chance for you know what? Here, now, now you're thinking, so crazy, now you're actually thinking, hey, is there someone here that maybe I could um, introduce to Jesus? <laughs> Engage in a Bible study. Connect to a community in Christ. Like, Every purpose and aim of your life has now been changed to an imparted righteousness where you actually have a desire to do righteous things. And, and I think finally, even a practiced righteousness. Not that you just desire to do righteousness, but you actually do do them. You actually read the Bible. You actually go to God in prayer. You actually engage in helping those that are marginalized by society. You actually enjoy having fellowship with other believers. You, you are actually now confessing sin that you thought you were going to take to your grave. The imputed, imparted, and practiced righteousness is all the righteousness that is in view here as you now fulfill, not by your actions, but by your ontology, by who you are, by this new creation of your status. You now are the fulfillment of all of God's plan, not from the old law, but now from the new law of the Spirit, and this new law of the Spirit gives, gives life. Let me, oh, here we go. The mind that is, uh, keep, uh, now reading on here, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. 
But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. You actually now begin to contemplate that which the Spirit desires. You're not contemplating, man, I, I wonder like what club would be the best club to go to tonight to maybe have the, the best population of, of romantic trysts or seductions that I could accomplish. I, I, I wonder, you know, who's selling the best fifth generation sense Amelia so I can just get high out of my mind tonight and where it is that I can go to have that kind of a hookup. Right? I mean, that's... I, but, I, but I think, stop and contemplate for a second. You don't actually scheme that way now. You have your mindset and you contemplate the things which the Spirit desires. You're interested in understanding more about the Spirit's Word. You're interested in knowing more about the Spirit's will. You're interested in being part of and in a better part of the community that has been brought together by the Holy Spirit baptized all by one spirit into one body. This, this is now the reality of your life. And it's a beautiful distinction. And Paul begins with saying there is no condemnation, but also get, get how different that was versus how different this is. Verse, six, the mind, uh, verse 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Even if it does so outwardly, it does so because there is an agenda when you peel back the layers that still comes back to not being God's agenda. And sadly, the agenda is self, self, self. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Verse 8. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You know, this is interesting too because th that just means those who are in the the, in the flesh, uh, just do not have that ability to please God. And there are people that we do see that do amazing and astounding things. But nonetheless, I know that even on the best of my days when I'd serve at a soup kitchen or make, make some differences on campus that I thought were admirable of one way or another, I, I also knew that this was going to really help my image. And, and even if it wasn't that ugly an agenda, I, I also knew that it made me feel good, and that's what kept me going for this. It, it wasn't something that would have happened if there was resistance, or, or if there was in any way not some sort of a personal fulfillment that was going on for me. But also notice that this idea here uses words that have an ongoing nature to the verb. It's not an intermittent interest in the things of the Spirit, but that your whole being now comes centered on what it is that the Spirit desires. What the Spirit does, and what the Spirit can do, and how the Spirit might use you, now becomes more and more your absorbing interest. Now, what a, what a beautiful path that we enter into. By the way, when, when we look at Romans 8, I think we've got to keep in mind Romans 1, 11, Paul says, I so desire to come to you and impart upon you some spiritual gift. Meaning that they don't have what was going on in Corinth. These folks aren't concerned about some sort of miraculous breakout of prophecy or wisdom or, or speaking in other languages. Uh, for, for, for them, that has not been realized in their neck of the woods, and at least as far as we know. And, and now what they do have, though, is a distinctively different appetite that centers around things of the Spirit. All right, so let's, let's move on now to this next section, verses 9 through 11. There, in this section, I want to just kind of look at as assurance. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And you're saying, whoa, where's the assurance? Why is there that big if that's in the middle of there? Paul uses the same type of argumentation, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 15, when he makes argument for the resurrection and the resurrection of, of, of Christ. All of the ifs that are there 
are not meant to throw you off balance. Those ifs could almost be better, better understood as since this is the case, you should connect the dots. So the if is a word that is a dot connector logically, the way that he's using it. And, and so he is saying that if and as indeed you are in, in a place where the Spirit of God dwells in you, then you're not in the realm of the flesh, but rather in the realm of the Spirit. Moving on. And if anyone, and by the way, what's interesting to note is that when he says in the realm of the Spirit and the Spirit of God dwells in you, he, he uses that you very precisely for the people of God that are receiving this letter. He then changes the pronoun and then says, well, if anyone, not if you, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, notice he backs off of that here because he's not trying to get you to be in that place of like, whoa, I better go through some intense self-assessment right now and be brutally honest with myself about whether I have the Spirit or not. That is not the flavor of this passage. And matter of fact, when he brings up the idea of anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, it begins with anyone, not if you don't. And they, not you, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, as in fact he is, you've got to keep that in mind, that is part of the argumentation uh, logic flow that Paul has in mind here, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. We've already talked about righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Again, as we as we recognize this idea of the Spirit of Christ that we talked about, I think, uh, yesterday at some point, it, it, it's interesting, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to, to Christ. Now, right before that, in referring to the Spirit of Christ, he says, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And you notice that there is a nice fluidity and kind of an interesting overlap here of the ideas of the Trinity. It's a very difficult concept, one that's always been hard for our finite minds to grasp, but, but nonetheless, to speak of the Spirit of Christ is just as easily to speak of the Spirit of God, just as easily to speak of the Holy Spirit. That all of that are, of course, some in some ways, uh, personality distinctions, but one essence, one person, nonetheless, in the midst of all of that. But, but again, I, I, I want you to kind of look at this and realize that this is a passage not about you trying to see if you really belong to Christ and whether you really have the Holy Spirit, whether you're really spirit, because if I don't, then I don't know if I'm really in Christ. This is the assumption that you have been recreated. You have been given a very distinct experience of being born again of water and spirit. And I love that that experience is one that is existential, one that is experienced and, and tangible. I've had a lot of bad days since March 17th of 1993 in my walk with Jesus, but I never doubt that I was born again of water and spirit on March 17th of 1993. And praise God that it isn't come forward and pray a prayer and have a, a, a feeling of intensity before you of faith and, and then that will give you regeneration by the Holy Spirit. If that's how it would go down, there would be a whole lot of doubt. And many of you who have done that approach have ended up with a massive uncertainty. Because did I kneel low enough? Did I pray intensely enough? Did I cry hard enough? Look, I better try it again. When's the next time we can come forward? When's the next time we can do this? And, and, and try it again, try it again. Again, Everything that God does is really there to make sure that you have a certainty and an assurance. Because my goodness, this gift is too massive for you to ever begin to second guess or discount. We won't be going through that slide. That's a keyism, but you know what? Years from now, you'll appreciate it. All right. Right. <laughs> It's the, end of the, it's the end of the morning of a long teaching. Uh, you, you would fall asleep in a moment. Uh, so moving on to Romans 8. I, I want to talk now with having now 
spoken of the distinction between ah, flesh and spirit, and now beginning to uh, uh, kind of hammer down, reinforce the assurance, he then turns towards obligation. And this is what he says in, in Romans 8, 12 and 13. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. It's also kind of the word for debt. We have a debt, but it's not a debt to the flesh. And, and, and said in other ways, you owe nothing to the flesh. There is nothing that the flesh has got on you. You're not under the realm of the flesh. You're not under the dominion of the flesh. And you are not in any way owing. And you're not delinquent to anything in the flesh. But we do have this beautiful obligation not to live according to the flesh. But we have a beautiful obligation not to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. This is a very famous passage, verse 13. It's uh, in the King James. It says, if you mortify, if you mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. Uh, and, and to mortify, you will get the idea of mortal. It, it, it is to put to death. And what is the obligation that we have? We have an obligation to take what is given to us and to make sure that we are putting it into action. You've been given the gift of gifts. Further on down, in, uh, you can scan forward a bit to uh, verse 32, I think it is. I have my glasses on. It says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? This gift of the Holy Spirit is a gracious gift. And how did it come about? By God not sparing his own son. And for us to keep in mind that we've entered into a beautiful obligation of a gift given. In a Roman colony and in Rome itself, in Rome itself there were two thought giants at this time, Seneca and uh, Cicero. And both of them wrote often of the idea of grace or caris. And in Rome and in the Roman colonies, like Ephesus, like Philippi, this, this idea of a gift given was explained as entering into a dance, entering into a beautiful obligation. And the whole system was built on the idea of a benefactor and a beneficiary, or a patron, a patron and a client. And if you were suddenly plucked out of your field job by a patron, by a benefactor, and brought into a trade craft, where suddenly your whole outlook for life has changed, and now suddenly you've earned a trade, you have an ability for a great income, not only you, but your generations after you have now seen the trajectory of your life radically changed. You have had all of that given to you, C Cicero or Seneca would say, by grace. Grace was an absolutely common word in all of the Roman colonies. Grace was the fabric that knit together the community of the Roman colonies. And it was not a, not a um, I'm going to kind of hold you in, in debt to myself. It was only positive. And it was this idea that I'm going to bestow upon you because I've chosen you, not because of any obligation on my part, but the initial giving of grace was always an unmerited, intense, amazing love bestowed on someone that changes their life. And if that has been given to you, you have welling within you a natural desire to return that favor. Seneca and Cicero said there is no law in any Roman colony to return the favor. Why? Because it's so unthinkable that anybody would not. I know, right? So when Jude writes about, you know, they turn the gift of God, they turn the grace of God into a, into a license for doing whatever they want, that's unthinkable in a Roman colony, that grace 
would ever turn into a, a credit card where you just keep running up the balance. But today's evangelicalism don't know how to get their own minds wrapped around grace. And so all they can do is have more teary-eyed stories of how much I've sinned, but yet how much Jesus still loves me, and how much greater my credit card debt is, and yet how much more he keeps paying it off. What is that but really a temptation to just turn it into a license for, for immorality? But not so the people receiving this letter. Not so for those that lived in this ecosystem of caudis or grace. The first gift given is caudis. The reception of that gift by the beneficiary is called eucaudis or Eucharist. Thanksgiving. So when, when grace makes the colony or makes the, the Rome itself knit together in unity, it's because someone gave cutties. Someone received it with you cutties. And then that someone who received it would automatically begin to think about their beautiful reciprocal obligation welling up out of that, that Thanksgiving to return the favor. And thereby... Continuing the dance. Continuing the dance. And as a matter of fact, Seneca and Cicero use the word picture of the, the goddess of grace. The goddess of Cadiz was um, depicted by three kind of lovely dancing ladies. Dancing hand in hand in a constant circle that never ends of beauty and joy and elegance all the way around. And for, for Paul to in a sense, appropriate that word caudis, and to talk about this gift that is graciously given through the, the, the sacrifice of the Son of Jesus, of the, through the Son that is Jesus, well then, that would then help everybody in the church realize, wow, that is the caudis given to us. We receive it with great thanksgiving, and now we realize that this gift includes the Holy Spirit. And what do I do with this? Now that I have an imputed and an imparted gift of this ability, I need to use it for, for the one that has given it to me. And you immediately begin through the, the Holy Spirit, then is, is that which... You just be so distracted. What is it? Inches and inches along? But now it's here, and now it's gone. But, but now I've been given this Spirit. What do I do with it? This is so exciting. What is it that I would do with this? And of course, you... You, you immediately are, are excited to, to enter into the dance. Enter into Who am I to enter into this dance with none other than the creator of all and, and, and to have received his very spirit within me. That's the holy obligation. And that's the kind of the teeth that is associated with grace. Great teeth. Because you want that. You want to be so honored and so dignified by being invited into that most exclusive of all dances. And who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to be pulled out of the fields and be now entered into a beautiful um, uh, relationship? Okay, moving on from there, in verse 14, it says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves so that you fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba! Abba, Father! The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. That's an interesting phrase. And some argue, are we body and spirit? Are we body, soul, and spirit? Hebrews 4 says that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 says that. That we, we have spirit and soul. It's a, an old argument, bipartite, tripartite nature of man, but don't worry about that right now, but we clearly have a spirit that the Holy Spirit kind of colludes with to send us on a beautiful path. And, and if you think about what is, but what is my spirit? I think your spirit is the image of God. The image of God in you. You are imagers of God. And that isn't really in your flesh. That's in your spirit. And, and having become imagers of God, the, the thing that makes you different from all other flesh is that you have the Spirit of God. If you're just fleshly, then you're just like any other creature, even like the snake in the, in the garden, who is not an imager of God, 
intelligent, could reason, could lie, could do all of that. That doesn't make the snake, the serpent, an image, an imager of God. What makes someone, though, an imager of God is to really recognize the, the ability to overcome one's kind of fleshly nature to just be impulsive, to me see, me want, me take, you know, the stuff we talked about with Samson the other night, that, that we're not just kind of a brute beast, that are, are slaves to whatever is the most recent thing that the lust of our eyes happen to fall upon. But that as imagers of God, we can recognize the power of delayed gratification. And, and through the Holy Spirit, also have a spirit of self-control that is able to delay gratification, realizing that, I, I think it was Johnny who said this yesterday, that to, to suffer because of what is going to come later is not a sacrifice, it's an investment. And it's beautiful prudence along the way. Now, this, this spirit that is given to us by the Holy Spirit confers with our spirit and helps us to appreciate now we are really his children. No, not if. Again, this is the argumentation language of Paul. Now, if we are his children, and you are, then we are heirs. He's not trying to get you to wonder, are you really his children? No, he's saying, okay, if this is the case, and it is, then guess what else needs to follow from that logically? You are heirs. You, you've got stuff coming your way as heirs, co-heirs with Christ. But for right now, we share in his sufferings, and that later we will share in his glory. And that means, leads me to this last section, which is glorification. But before I get to that, uh, there is something really special about being a child. One of my, my favorite pictures is, is the, 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 the picture of... Um, of uh, John John uh, Kennedy sitting under the desk of JFK as JFK is kind of working on the affairs of state. And, and there he is kind of playing underneath the, the, the desk in the Oval Office itself. Not, not worried like, oh, should I be here? Should I not be here? He's like, of course I need to be here. This is where my daddy is. So I'm going to hang here. And even if he says to me, hey, 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 John John, please, I'm, I'm trying to work right now. John John's not going to be like, okay, okay. And he's like, no, I, I want time with you, Dad. And he's going to have a beautiful, shameless audacity about insisting on really keeping the relationship going that's there. That's what God wants from you. He wants you to be shamelessly audacious, as he teaches us even about prayer in, in, uh, in Luke 11. When, when they come to him and say, teach us how to pray. And, and Jesus says, all right, start your prayers with this. More of a bombshell than you realize. Father. What? We start our prayers with that? Father? And then he goes on to say, hey, yeah, what if a visitor comes and you need to you know, get them some, some bread at 2 a.m. in the morning? And, and, you know, who's who's going to kind of knock on a door with, with, with that intensity? Well, that's how your prayer should be. You knock on the door with all that you've got until the, until the bread comes. The, the, again, they're going to come because of your shameless audacity. Who, who is it in my life that could come banging on my door at, at 3 a.m. saying, you know what? I'm thirsty. I need something to drink. <laughs> right? Don's a good guy. like him. But I'm going to be like, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> All those nice things I said about Nate yesterday, all those nice things that Steve said about me at breakfast um, just the, the other day when we were together, um, as he was listening to me. Uh, I mean, I was telling him about all the people in my family with cancer and how I was just really distraught and I just needed an ear to, to, to listen. I, I knew I was taking up his time. I bought his breakfast. But anyway... Thanks for listening, Steve. That was, that was so helpful. <laughs> but but if it's if it's Steve, if it's Nate, if it's, it, you know what? You come to my door at, at 2 a.m. and you're like, I'm thirsty. I'm like, you are, what is wrong with you? But if it's my daughter, I'm gonna be like, oh honey, what's the matter? Come on, yeah, let me let me help you out. What is it? 
I mean, do you have a headache? What's going on? Let me help. Right? I'm going to be like up and at it. Why? That's my child. That's what God wants from you. He wants you to cry out, Abba, Father. He wants you to cry out with shameless audacity. He wants you to have this confidence. And Paul is building a sequence of logical statements so that you have that confidence and you use it. And the reason you have that confidence is not because you have your own performance record. The reason you have that confidence is because the Holy Spirit has imparted that status upon you. Not just of amazing righteousness that opens doors, but of a righteousness that exceeds any righteousness of relationship. It's, it's a relationship of, of a child that has been fully adopted in Rome with all the rights and all of the promised inheritance that's coming your way. Sweet stuff that's, that, that's there. All right, and then lastly, let's look at glorification. I'm going to um, swing through this, and we'll be done in about three minutes, I hope, uh, to make lunch at 12.15. I consider that our present sufferings, verse 18, are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right in the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, not that we are the first fruits of the Spirit, Jesus is the first fruits of the Spirit, but we have the first fruits of the Spirit. In other words, we've only got a foretaste of heaven divine. We only have, yes, we have the Holy Spirit, but just wait until Jesus returns and all things are made new. Just wait until 1 John 3, 2 is realized that, hey, who we are ain't nothing compared to who we're going to be. It's still going to be our bodies, but it's all going to be transformed. It's all going to be amazing when the Holy Spirit is able to have unlimited transformational access to all of creation, including us. Whoa, what's going to really happen? And all of it has already been guaranteed by the giving of the Spirit in our rebirth. Man, are we an amazing people. The, for in this hope, we were saved. The word hope is misused in English probably as much as any biblical word. Maybe the most, really. Because we sadly use hope as if there's a hedging of bets in the idea of the word. We use hope trying to say, you know what? I hope the Mets don't come in last place this year. Whereas it should be more used of, I hope the Yankees win yet another championship this year. Like, I mean, I'm talking about absolute certainty in the latter Whereas in the former, it was like, man, maybe, you know, a wild pipe dream of a possibility. There is no wild pipe dream of a possibility in hope. Hope is a joy-injecting, anxiety-abolishing certainty of events to come that it is not so much an exercise in patience and perseverance as it is one of simple prudence. Because it's guaranteed. And of course, with such a guarantee coming my way, I'm going to live in logical sense and prudence because that's what is the future. There is no shifting of shadows of change. If we hope for what we have not, what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through worldly groans. And, and why? Even though this hope is so beautiful and brilliant and magnificent, transcending, it is nonetheless not here now. And what is here now is suffering. And we suffer now and we grow now because there's glory coming later. And as we suffer now, we also realize that this exercise of delayed gratification is going to be the greatest trade-off ever imagined. Verse 27, uh, verse 26 again. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. 
Now here's something even cooler. Later in this chapter, we won't get to this, it says Jesus himself has ascended into heaven to make intercession for us. It's as though we're sending up our requests to Jesus. He is our advocate who's going to broker all of these intercessions, all of these requests for us in the heavenly realm. But you may not even know how to send it up. You don't even know what to say. Like, I know Jesus is up there making intercession, but I don't know. I don't even know what to hope for right now. This is crazy. What's coming is so beautiful, but what's going on right now is so awful. So, ah, I don't know. That, that's good enough. Because the Holy Spirit has a cool little Google Translate going on there. That kind of turns that into the most eloquent petition that Jesus takes, who then edits it yet even more and makes intercession for that ah, on your part that becomes a grant proposal that no one could ever say no to. You got two editors after your groan comes sadly spilling out of your mouth. But you got a God who loves you and wants it to be nothing less than the most beautiful articulation of God's will for you if you knew how to say it. And, and that's, that's what comes out of you. Uh, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for those, for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many. Jesus is the firstborn, but only among you, his brothers and sisters. You are actually already on the guaranteed path of Jesus, because he's simply the firstborn of what all of us will then be. And those he predestined, he also called, those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And that will be your final state. You will have a new heaven and a new earth. This new hope in which we live, God will come down and be with us. All earth will be made new. All heavens will be made new. We will have imperishable, beautiful, astounding bodies and interactions no more tears. The work of our hands will be fantastic. Everything that we do is going to be astounding. And just in case you can't kind of keep your eye on that ball, the Holy Spirit is here to help you remember and help you realize who you are and where it is that you are going. And if the best that you can offer up is, ah, well, then he's got you even in that moment. And if for a second you become you enter into a, a covenant of fear because you think there's a bunch of if-then statements that are going to cause you to wobble. He's even got you there. You are the child. Have shameless audacity. Use this, this attribution that has been given to you because you now have the DNA of the Holy Spirit. That is what defines you. He is what defines you in, in all of this. And, and to walk this life with the great confidence that, you, that, that you've been given. And enter into the dance. Enter into the dance. You have the power to do so. You've got the gift and then some. And you've also got the gift of the empowering to do so. And enjoy life to the full as you enter into the dance that the Holy Spirit allows you to do. And when you do, you will realize that you are more than conquerors. Condemnation? Pff, why do I even imagine that? Condemnation is in the rearview mirror. What is before me is the next conquest. What is beside me and, and in me and about me is the very power of the Holy Spirit of God paracleting me all the way through to ultimate glorification. Amen. Thanks. Enjoy your life.